Hey everybody, welcome, welcome. Hey Kevin, hey Katie. Hey Ms. What Bruce. up, Sarah? Hi. So good to see you. How are you doing? Me? Mm -hmm. yeah. So Ash is at house, and I'm here with the kids. <laughs> we got oh, a big wow. event. Wow. So are you in one of your kids' bedrooms? No, that's the leftover decorations from the birthday party. Oh, wow. Whose yeah. birthday was it? Uh, Cade's, his seventh birthday. Seventh? Wow. <laughs> what? Tom is lying. Mm-hmm. Yeah, wow. he's seven even... years older. <laughs> yeah. So, well, um, everybody meet Kevin Gomez. He's my friend from college. And so we've had Katie and we've had Miss Brenda with us for the last uh, couple of weeks. We mixed last week. So uh, thank you all for coming back. And then we have Miss Cindy. I think this is this is your first time joining. So welcome, welcome everybody. People come on like as they see it online. So thank you for being here. So how many of y'all have gotten the book? Does everybody have the book that's on the call? And if you can turn your cameras on because we're streaming online. And so it's more interactive when your, when your video is on. So does everybody have the book? Yeah. I know you got the book. Miss Cindy, do you have the book? You can chat, type in the chat if you're with me. Katie, did you finally get your book? No, and I came to my mom's house early to find hers and I don't know where it is, so. Oh no. So, okay, so DM me or text me afterwards so we can figure out what, what's going on with that because you should have okay. received that a long time ago. Okay. Okay, we've got Letitia, she's joining. So in the book, we, we left off in section two in the investment strategies and Miss Cindy said she ordered, but she had issues. So, Miss Cindy, did did your did your order process, or do, are you still having issues? Because I can just mail you guys one directly, like if you if you want me to. So, just send me a message in the chat if you want me to mail you a copy if your order didn't go through. Okay. So. Um, the book, we are, are in section two, and we are talking about investment strategies. And so last time that we met, we had a very great discussion um, about some of you all's goals and interests and what particular investment strategies that you all like kind of had heard about. I know somebody mentioned wholesaling. I know we talked about flipping. Um, so we went through the BRR strategy. We went through short-term rentals, Airbnbs. We know a lot of people love to do that. We talked about uh, new construction. Did we get as far as new construction? I think we did in land development. And so today we'll start off with moderate investment strategies. So um, can y'all see me clearly? Is everything good? Can y'all see me? Okay, cool. So we'll start off with moderate investment strategies. I know I'm kind of like sitting opposite of the sunlight. So I don't know if that's giving you all the glare, but I'm doing my best here, guys. So um, moderate investment strategies, before I dive into it, like how are you all feeling in terms of your readiness to invest? How are you feeling in terms of your confidence to invest? And, and really, we talked about on the first session, your why. But since we've begun our discussion, has there been any like self-limiting thought patterns that, that have kind of countered that excitement to invest? So let's just spend about five minutes talking about like self-limiting thoughts that as soon as you get this great idea, this passion in your heart, is there anything that comes up that makes you go, I can't do that, or I probably won't be able to do that? If so, let's talk about it. Who wants to go first? Um, I think you've done actually a really incredible job job at making this feel attainable. Like you, you inspire me to make me feel like this is something I can do. Um, my only, I guess not hesitation even, it's just like, I'm, I want to hear your perspective on all of the different 
investment types and then like try and figure out what I think the best way for me to proceed would be. So I don't, I feel like there's not at this moment, there's not one right now where I'm like, oh, this is for sure the path that I want to go. Um, but yeah. I'm just like, kind of, I think I need to just like hear everything and then just be prayerful and like pray into it and see if there's like one that kind of jumps out at me to figure out like how I even want to start. Love that. Love that. Hey, everybody on Instagram, where if you want to jump into the live discussion, go to the Facebook page and click the Zoom link. And if you want to be a part of the book club, then I can add you to the email list as well. All right. So anybody else? Like I know, Kevin, we talked about investing for a few years. Anybody else? You just feel invincible. Like I, I can do all things. Nothing's going to stop me. Or are you feeling some reservations or hesitation? And if so, what what is causing that hesitation from you? Just going in and starting your legacy and starting that that pursuit of ownership now. Anybody, 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 come on y'all, come on. We live, anybody. Yeah, so I would say for me, uh, over the past couple weeks, um, I don't know where everybody is, but I would say as far as making investments in real estate, I'm probably furthest away. Um, I just feel like capacity, just time capacity. You know, just in what I do on the on the day to day, um, I think we've had enough work done on our own residence where we're within arm's reach of the right people. Mm -hmm. And so I don't even think that's a constraint. It's just I, I, I applaud you and am in awe of people like you because it's just like I don't know how you do everything that you've described outside of whatever your normal day-to-day -day is. Well, I'm glad you brought that up, Kevin, because moderate investment strategies are less involved than active investment strategies, which we talked about last uh, two weeks ago. So active investment strategies require pretty much like a full-time commitment. You will be actively involved in the day-to-day -day management. Moderate investment strategies, you will have some decision-making and some control However, you, you don't have to do this as your day job. It can be something like in the beginning of the process, it takes more of your time. And then it's sort of like a set and forget where you're periodically going back to um, recalibrate and make sure everything is aligned to your initial investment strategy. And then when we get to passive investments, that's where for people like yourself, possibly if you're interested in that, where you're really just inserting the money and you're waiting because you're not involved in any of the active management or decision making. So it's something for everybody. I realize that it's not really realistic for everybody to make the commitment that I've made. Um, I'll just be honest, investing in real estate has pulled me almost like 95% away from selling real estate directly because it's, it's really hard when you have a bunch of active projects to then go and like step away to be fully engaged in, you know, like how active real estate sales is. But it is possible to do both. It's just like kind of like an ebb and flow. So Seth on Instagram said, timing for the housing market, is it the wrong time? Well, um, just, in a blanket answer, no, it's never a wrong time to invest. Your strategy might change or your location or your market might change, but there's always a right time to invest because in a depressed market is the best time to buy real estate. So um, my answer is gonna be no. Um, we can talk, we can, I'll do a whole nother session about like timing and like the economy and all of that, but just for this session, um, Letitia said, no reservations. I can do all things. I believe God is leading. Yes. That's how I want y'all to feel by the time you're done reading this book. I want you to know, no matter, even if everything financially, everything timing wise feels off, I want you to feel, to know with a certainty that you absolutely will invest. And not only that you will invest, that you must invest. And so there's going to be a fire that causes you to continue your pursuit, even when everything feels wrong. 
you know, like, and I'll just give you an example. I've been pursuing an apartment building for two years. Every time I would call the owner, it's not for sale. She would hang up in my face and she would tell me like negative things. Like you'll never be in this market. You'll never, you'll never, like never just saying these really, think these really blatant, like disrespectful things to me. Then on top of that, the price that she wanted for the building was so far beyond my financial capacity. And I didn't even know where to get the money from. Right. And then on top of that, the property is such so extremely depressed, distressed that it doesn't even make sense to buy it. On top of that, the owner is in a lawsuit has been sued because the property has mold on top of that you know it's just like all of these different layers of problems however when you get your heart set on something and when you when you have that driving force behind you where you feel like god is putting you like you must do this then it doesn't matter how many different roadblocks or barriers are standing in front of you you just keep punching them down punching them down so now two years later I have an offer in with the owner on the property. I've gotten approved for a five, a $6 million loan for the building. I have the contracts lined up to renovate it. I have the property managers. I have everything, pretty much everything I need to move forward. And I have, I've been going back and forth with the owner and she's like, if you give me an offer at this amount, I'll accept it. So I went from being told never to negotiating with the owner directly so that's just an example like don't let these limitations or these thoughts hinder you because you can do all things so um let's dive into investment strategies if you haven't got your book what you can do is you can zell me right now 31 dollars i think it's 31 and that will i'll ship you actually it's 36 with shipping so sell me $36 and I'll drop these in the mail for you today, okay? And then put your address and then I'll make sure you get it. And if you've already paid for one, I'll figure out how to refund it to you online, okay? All right, everybody. So we're talking about section two, the basics of investing. Moderate investment strategies are turnkey investments, turnkey rentals. We've got wholesaling. We've got the RRR strategy and we've got the buy and hold strategy. Did we go over these last time? I can't remember. Did we go over these? Did we go over wholesaling last time? Yeah. Okay. So we talked about moderate. Let's move into passive investment strategies. So passive, we've got private lending. We've got REIT investments. We've got partnerships, which I love partnerships. And then we've got crowdfunded investment strategies. Um, so in these scenarios, you can look at them from either the perspective of you being the investor investing into someone else's project or you being the sponsor or the developer and raising capital that other investors invest into your project. So if you're looking at it from the perspective of you want to build something big, but you know you've got to raise capital, then passive investors would execute this strategy to invest in your project. If you're looking at it from the point of I'm busy, I just want to invest in real estate. I know real estate, is, it works. I know long-term my money will grow, but I don't have time. Then this could be your strategy that you implement. Does that make sense? Any questions? So a lot of my business partners that invest with me are passive investors because they don't want the risk. They don't want the liability. They don't want, the, they don't want to have meetings. They don't want to make decisions. All they want to do is grow their wealth. So they already have money that's sitting in a savings account or sitting in an investment account, and they don't want to do the work, but they want to be invested in real estate. So they are passive investors, and I am an active investor, and they passively invest in my deals that I sponsor. So I hope that's clear. So, but I'm going to teach it to you, but depending on what you want to do, you could be on either side of that coin. Okay, so private lending. Private lending would be, instead of you going to a bank or instead of you, well, instead of you going to a bank to get a loan, like if I'm an investor and I, I can go to, 
Comerica, I can go to Bank of America, I can go to a commercial lender. But instead of going there, I could actually go to a person who has money. It could be my parent, it could be my neighbor, it could be someone I met at a real estate event. And this person could be someone that has a large retirement fund or they can have money in savings or they could have just had a really good year and they don't want to pay taxes on that money or whatever the case is. And they're looking for a strategy to to do something with that money so they can make a loan out of their own funds to me and become a private lender in that particular situation. And you could do this as well. So I'm trying to explain it from both perspectives. So if you want a passive investment strategy and you have funds then you can find an investor like myself that you can make loans to. Now, the great thing about passive investing as, you know, as a private lender is that your loan is secured by the property that that person is buying. So whenever someone would make me a loan, in exchange, they would get a note. And that note would be a promise to repay that loan. And that note would be secured by a deed of trust. In the state of Texas, a deed of trust is what gives that lender, even if it's a person, it gives that lender the right to foreclose on that property and take it from me. So if I did not repay that loan, even though they may only be lending 5% of what I actually need to buy the property, they may only be be lending me 1% of what I need to buy the property. They could ultimately take 100% of the value of that property if I fail to repay that loan, and then they could sell that property and recoup their investment. So the good thing about a private lending strategy is that it's better than your your family member coming to you and saying, hey, I got this business I want to get in. You know, I want to open up an ice cream shop in my town. You want to put 30,000 into it. Like we see a lot of, you know, those people that are the first to make it out of their families they end up oftentimes making these very risky investments of family and friends because let's say you've made it to the NFL or let's say you've you've succeeded in your career and you're sitting on money and people are aware of it. Whenever they have a dream or a vision, oftentimes they'll reach out to that person and say, hey, can you invest? Well, whenever you invest your money into someone's project or business, there's no security. There's no promise to repay. It's sort of like you, you're believing in that person's idea But if that person doesn't really know what they're doing, or if in the general course of business, the business doesn't perform up to the results, then there's no recourse on that investment. I'm hoping y'all are tracking with me. So put in the chat, put some comments or some notes if y'all understand what I'm saying. If you don't understand, just put a comment. So when you make a private loan to someone that invests in real estate, you actually have a lien against that property. You are your note becomes the lien against that property. So you 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 feel protected, you feel safe because that person took your ten thousand dollars or your fifty thousand dollars and they went and bought a three hundred thousand dollar property. So now you have a three hundred thousand dollar property that you only got like you only put fifty thousand in. So it's almost like a win for you. The downside of private lending is that you don't get to participate in the win with that investor if all goes well and if they hold that property for many years you don't get to participate in the residual income on that property and when they sell that property for a profit you don't get to participate in the profits from that sale all you get is your interest that you earned from making a loan but the good thing about private lending is that you can set your own interest rate so if you have your money in the bank and you're earning one percent you're earning, I don't know, Kevin, he works in the financial realm. If you have your money invested in a stock and you're earning 10%, then you can make a loan to an investor and you can set a 15% interest rate. You can set your rate at whatever you can get that person to agree to. So if you've got someone that knows what they're doing and you trust them, then you've got a really great investment opportunity. You're able to turn a higher profit on your money versus sitting it in a bank account. And you don't have to do any of the work. All you have to do is wait. And the longer that person holds your money, the more interest you earn. So even if that person doesn't return your money, let's say they say they're going to do a six-month loan. 
But in the terms of your note, you'll say between months six and 12, the interest rate will increase by 2% or something. And after 18 months, the interest rate, you know, you'll have to pay, you know, 18% interest. So even if that person ultimately finishes their project from their profits, you will get a greater share because of how, how long they borrowed your money. And so if that's something that you're interested in, I'm about to do a project where I'll do convertible notes. And that means that I really want people to own, I'm, I'm gonna do 50 houses and I'll give people the opportunity to invest in those 50 houses. Um, this is something that you can do in your respective cities with whatever project that you want. So I'm just giving you an example. So I'm going to raise a fund to do 50 houses. I'm going to go to the bank and take a, a loan for 80% of the project cost. And then I'm gonna raise the other 20% as a second loan from private lenders, which are people, anybody can make a loan. So let's say I raise a million dollars and let's say I raise a million dollars and I, I'll give a 6% interest rate in this example. Well, most of those people that are investing are not investing because they really want a 6% interest on their investment. They want a piece of the 50 houses because anybody that would invest in, in residential real estate in that way would probably want a piece of the bigger pie because they know over a five or 10 year period, they're gonna get residual payments that would be higher than a 6% return. So, but a convertible note is another way that you can structure a private loan and it can be beneficial to you as the investor and it can be beneficial to the lender as well because it gives them opportunity to kind of have their cake and eat it too. So when you do a convertible loan, basically it gives that investor or that lender maybe six months to a year to convert to equity. So if they make you a loan and they see, well, well, Katie, you really are doing a great job. Well, Cindy, you really, you really, you, you bought that apartment building. I like the way you're remodeling it. You really did what you said. I want equity in this deal. I think you're really going to complete this project and I want to convert my loan to equity. That's what a convertible note is. It gives that private lender the opportunity to buy into your project at a greater level. So they convert that loan into equity that no longer has to be repaid. So now there's no obligation for you as the investor to pay them back. But when that apartment is rented out or when that house is finished and is sold, then that investor now gets a piece of your pie. They get a piece of your equity that would be greater than what they would have gotten if they just accepted the interest. Are y'all uh, y'all flowing with me? Does this make sense? I'm really talking about it from both sides, from you being the investor. If you have money, then you could be the private lender. If you are the person who has the project, but you don't have the money, then you would be looking for a private lender. And that private lender can be right there in front of your face. I know a woman, I think I told y'all this story. Her private lender was her husband's grandmother. I was like, whoa, how you do that? So she got like a 90 year old woman to become her private lender because this woman cared about what she was doing. This woman cared about the community that she was living in and she didn't want to die leaving this community in shambles. And because she had saved her retirement and she was living fine, she's like, I'd rather, instead of this money sitting in this bank account, I'd rather do something with it that's gonna be productive. So she did that and she made a private loan to her husband's wife, but she did not disclose this to the family. This is not the type of thing that you want to go tell people because you know all kind of crazy gossip could happen in that scenario, but it worked and they started flipping houses together. A young woman and a, a young white woman and an old black lady got together as business partners and they started funding the transformation of this community. And the work that they did made the newspaper. And then the bank started to take notice. Wow, how, how, look at, how, how are you doing all these houses? And she just disclosed to me that it was this dynamic duo of two very 
you know, unexpected partners that came together to do this work. So anywhere that you go, if you like, you're interested in this strategy for private lending, if you are the person with the money, you should be looking for the person that's credible. You should be looking for the person with experience. You should be looking at their work. You should be walking their properties to see that they've finished a project. And then you can say, hey, I'll bankroll you privately. You know, I'll, I'll take a risk on you for one deal. And if it works, then you just keep doing it over and over again. If it doesn't work, then you've got a property. You can make it convert to equity. So if they can't pay you back, well, now you're a partner in their property. And if you want to foreclose on them, you can go through that process as well. So that's just one idea. What are y'all thoughts about that? Anybody on Instagram? Seth said, what's the minimum amount to be a passive investor? There's no minimum amount to be a passive investor. So like, for example, like in my, in my deal, I, I think I'm going to raise $4 million. So my minimum investment might be 25,000 per person because I need to raise higher amounts of money. But if someone has a deal where they need to raise 50,000, they, they could go to five people and get $10,000. So it, they're, it's just going to vary depending on if you know what I would say, if you are the passive investor, you figure out how much money you want to invest and just realize as a private lender, you have no control. You don't get a say so in the color of the floors. You don't get to, you know, you don't get to be the flipper. You get to bankroll the flipper. So you just have to really understand your role. Um, and I met a man who had funded over 400 flips privately. He had basically become his own bank. He had, I got to charge my computer. Hold on, y'all. So have y'all ever heard of hard money? Have y'all ever heard of hard money? Okay, hard money lenders are private lenders. So that's a good example. Hard money lenders, they make high interest rate loans to investors that um, flip real estate or build new construction or you know typically the point of someone going to a private lender is because it's easier it's faster if i i started i started um you know and that's a good place for you all to start if you were like how am i ever going to get a loan i have bad credit i don't have any money well hard money lenders they don't do they don't do any any background checks on you they don't pull your credit. They don't look at your bank statements. All they say is, do you want this loan? Sign here. And you sign there and you will have money in 48 hours, right? But in exchange for that, your interest rate will be about 12%. So you said, what's the common interest rate from a private lender? Is the common interest rate will be anywhere from 12, anywhere from 12 to 14%. But remember, these are typically for short term investments. So a flipper would go to a hard money lender or a private lender and they would borrow that money for six months. So instead of paying 12% actual like cash, you're going to pay half for however many months that you borrow that money. So if you can flip a house in three months, you pay 3% on that money. So it's really going to come down to your speed and how quickly you can finish your project so that you don't have these, you know, really high interest rates. Uh, somebody asked, how much capital at a minimum to start being a private lender? I think I answered that already. There's no minimum. You Whatever you have, you can be a private lender with that. If you can find someone that can do a project with that, or you can put your money into a larger deal where there's multiple people lending. And I'll get into that in, I'll get into that in when we talk about um, crowdfunding because crowdfunding models allow you to invest as a lender or invest as equity partner. All right, I really went deep on that one, it goes, way deeper in the book see y'all thought that i was playing when i said i wrote this book to help y'all but 
I was not. I really literally wrote the textbook on investing. You see this? I wrote the textbook, okay? This was not nice stories about myself that I wrote in this book. I actually wrote technical data on how to execute these strategies. Okay, so the next section is, let's see. The next section is REITs. So have y'all ever heard of the word REIT? REIT, Kevin, yes. Kevin, can you come online and tell people what you do? I'm gonna let you plug yourself. Y'all, Kevin Gomez is on Zoom. Kevin is about to speak and tell y'all who he is. Yeah, that is funny. Um, I'm a wealth management advisor. I have been for the last 16 years. Um, since Beryl and I have known each other, um, a big part of the time I've been a wealth management advisor. And so we work with um, families who are trying to figure out if they can retire. And then we work with uh, families who run successful businesses on getting really organized and just putting a really good team in place around them. Um, and so we build comprehensive plans to help people be able to align whatever their personal vision and goals are um, to their actual actions. And so depending on who you are, that could mean different things. But, you know, given what Farrell is talking about, if you are trying to figure out like how and where real estate investing fits into your life, it should really start with what's my personal vision, you know, around how I want to end up. And then you funnel that through, you know, whether it's passive investing, active investing, moderate investing, how many homes, what type of projects. Because ultimately when you can say, hey, here's where I want to wind up, you should be able to piece together, well, here are the steps I need to take to get there. And then like Katie mentioned, she's going to pray about, you know, what she should really participate in a financial term that helps people figure out what they should participate in is their tolerance for risk. It's called a risk tolerance. And so some people are very conservative. Some people are very aggressive and some people are like right in the middle. And so I think as you read this book, if you can uh, read through the different strategies as you become more knowledgeable how they feel as you read about them. And that little, you could call it the Holy Spirit, but probably what is also there is, man, if this scares me, then that means, you know, this strategy to me might seem aggressive. And mm -hmm. so if you push through and grab more knowledge there and it still seems scary, then that may be something that's too aggressive for you. And that might be a way to vet it as well. That's excellent, Kevin. So I would like, I'm going to host a seminar on for investors, and I would love to zoom you in to talk about this, this risk assessment, or even if yep. you could like take people through like a sample risk assessment, that mm -hmm. really, really a great way to help enable people to make decisions to yeah. kind of weed things out and say, okay, I really don't feel comfortable doing that financially, because it's no like, I don't want anybody to ever feel bad because they're like, man, I don't have enough faith to do that. Well, that's not always the case. That That's just not for you. So when you feel that, like, oh, I just, I couldn't do that. That's fine. Don't do it because you don't ever want to do anything you don't have a piece about. But a way that you can help establish that piece is going through these assessments. And so Kevin has been my wealth manager for, for like years now. And so every year we have a like meeting about our plan for the future. And every time I hear Kevin say something because he manages uh, wealth for like people that have far more money. And it always pushes my thinking ahead because he's able to take his experiences from all of these different people's um, financial situations and then hope me to think bigger or help me to really like think more st structured like you need to really focus on this and that and that and I'll be honest I haven't 
I haven't always done what he said, but it has at least given me some road markers to say, I'm going to do that. That's smart. I am going to do that when I get a chance. And yeah. so that's where I am with Kevin. I, I encourage y'all to, to shoot him a message or shoot me a message if you want to speak with him to help you plan out how you're going to spend all of your money that you're going to make in the comic club. Yeah, I think, Pharaoh, what you've exhibited is an extreme alignment with uh, Christ and where there might have been um, un, like no clarity. Mm -hmm. um, I think you said, hey, this is what I want. And I, I don't think there ever was a fear, but there might be no clarity. And then what I've heard you say just in years of talking is either you'll get confirmation in a dream or the support of Nick would we'll just be there and say, well, go for it, babe. And you're like, well, I don't know how we're going to do it. But then you start walking in, you know, faith. And so I, I would encourage people, you know, when we are also trying to be on a very real spiritual journey as well that you know sometimes the the tools of the world risk tolerance and saying hey here's conservative balanced and aggressive we have to understand that we follow a more powerful uh, guy and so i think with you saying hey I haven't followed every piece of your advice because you were following the main advice. That's right. Ah! So I like you, Kevin. I like you a lot. Okay, so let's get back on topic, even though I feel like that was very important. I hope y'all were listening to what he said. Uh, we took a little detour from the topic. So we're gonna talk about real estate investment trust. So real estate investment trust, a REIT, R-E-I-T, somebody type that in the chat. R-E-I-T, a REIT, is a company that owns, manages, and finances income producing commercial property assets. And it allows numerous individual investors to pull capital and then they earn dividends. So with REITs, dividends are required by the IRS to pay out 90% of their earnings to in dividends. So people invest in REITs kind of like stock because they know they're going to get a dividend. So it's like investing in real estate through a platform like you buy stock. So if you've ever bought stock, I think it's become more common now, especially um, where there are these platforms and these exchanges that have made investing more accessible for people to do so without um, going through like a formal broker. And Kevin can probably explain this a little bit better than I can. People have, I would say they've been investing in stock on more of like trends and like social media fads without really doing research. And so if they hear like, oh, I should invest in this gaming stock or I should invest in this tech stock, it's really like where people used to use empirical data and they used to study charts and they and and they still do, but they there used to it used to be more common for younger investors to want to study finance and really understand the performance of a company before they just buy into it. Now, what I've seen is sort of like this social craze of it, like a like a company can trend on Twitter and then everybody will go buy its stock and the people really don't have any substance behind their investments. Well, real estate investment trusts allow you to not only invest in a company, but you're investing in a commercial real estate company or a trust where investors are pooling capital. So instead of me and Kevin and Katie and Brenda and Cindy and Letitia getting together and we pull our capital and we raise $100,000 and we go and buy a building, you're doing that times the thousands. So this is where REITs are able to buy shopping malls. 
and they're buying retail strips and they're buying restaurants and they're and they're actually operating those real estate commercial businesses. Um, they are renting those out to the Carabas and to the cheesecake factories of the world. And so their income is coming in from the rental income on these large commercial investments. And so um, the studies show that uh, 145 million Americans live in a household that's already invested in a REIT through their 401k, through their IRA, through their pension fund. So your 401ks are invested in REITs. But you also have the opportunity to directly invest as an individual. So you can, you can go and you can go through different platforms that will allow you to purchase REIT, purchase buy into REITs. And there's three types. So there's equity REITs, there's mortgage REITs, and there's hybrid. And so these REITs, either they actually own the income producing properties, so they own the shopping mall, for example, or they own the mortgage on that shopping mall. So, or it's a hybrid, they invest in both. So they either buy the note or they buy the building itself. And so if you invest in a REIT, the good thing about the REIT is that you're gonna get a dividend every year. Now the income is going to be divided by all of the owners. So, you know, you would have to do your research to figure out what's the average return that you would get by investing in that REIT. But it's a great investment strategy if you don't want to directly, like you want to be involved in commercial real estate, but you don't want to manage that. You want to say you own a mall, but you don't actually want to have to raise $50 million to buy a mall. So this is an opportunity and I can go so much deeper into REITs, but some of the pros is a potential for long-term appreciation. So when you invest in stock, like let's say you invest in Apple. Okay, maybe Apple's not a good example. Let's say you invest in Tesla and you're, you're banking on the fact that Tesla's technology is going to continue to be great. They're gonna to continue to sell cars. You know, their engines are going to perform, you know, whatever the reason why you would invest in Tesla. However, you're not actually let me say it a different way. When you buy into a REIT, you are investing directly into that mall. So the value of that property where the mall is renting out all these spaces will continue to rise over time based on historical data. So that mall today might be worth $50 million. And then in 10 years, it might be worth $60 million. So you're also benefiting not only from the income that Dillard's and Macy's pays, the profits from that rental income, you're also benefiting from the equity that that building and that land has, has grown over the time that you're invested in that REIT. So that's a benefit. The negative side of REITs is that it's considered taxable income. So uh, all the taxable income that goes into the REIT and they have to pay out 90% of their, of their earnings. So it's really hard for them to continue to grow and buy additional properties because they're paying out so much of their profits. So if you were an investor and you made $100,000, there's a really good chance that you would take 90% of that and buy more investments with it because you don't want to have to pay taxes on it. But REITs, by mandate have to pay it out, which means they can't just continue to grow and grow and expand their portfolio as quickly as you could if you directly manage your own investment. So that same you know, $5,000 that you could invest in a REIT, you might have more freedom and liquidity with it if you invested it directly into your own property that you managed yourself. So you would have to consider, do I want to invest directly in you know, do I want to own my own retail strip? And do I want to be the one to go find the hair salon and the coffee shop and the hair store and the nail shop that's going to go in it? And do I want to collect my own rents on that commercial strip? Or do I want to be in a passive role and I will invest in a REIT, a real estate investment trust, and allow them to do the management for that work? Another downside is because they're doing that management 
they will charge management fees. So all of the general and administrative fees for managing all those properties will come out of the value of that investment. Okay, but it's easy, easy to do. You guys can just Google REITs online and you can join an investment platform, which I didn't recommend any in my book because I don't want any of you all to say that I told you to invest in something because I didn't. But you can just find REITs online and, and it's very simple to invest in them. And I wanna say the minimum investment can start around like $250. And then someone said, forgive me if you have already said this, but how do we get your book? Okay, so you can get my book. I was just told that some people are having issues getting it. You can go to wemustown.com we must own.com and you can buy it online if you have issues you can just dm me and i can mail you one because i have some i'm trying to type in on on instagram at the same time we must own.com it will be available on amazon and all those platforms soon but for now, if you just DM me, I can give you a Zelle or a Cash App and I can ship you one today. Okay. So then anybody have questions about REITs? I'm sure you do. Anybody have a question about a REIT? Questions, comments? Okay. There are more than 200 real estate investment trusts on public exchanges. Now, private REITs, you want to invest in a private REIT that's not publicly traded, most times the investment is $250,000 or more. Okay, the next investment strategy is joint ventures or partnerships. So I love a good partnership. I love a good partnership, okay? It's nothing like unity. It's nothing like having two people that agree two or more people that agree because what God is in the midst. Okay. So whenever you have two or more people or companies that come together for a common vision or mission, you have a partnership, you have a joint venture. We've heard of this before. You could also have partnerships where the objective of the company is to purchase, acquire, manage, rent, you know, whatever your objective is, you can get together and you do that with two individuals or you do that with two companies that that would be called a joint venture. Okay, I currently have multiple partnerships. And in the book, I talk about how to form a partnership in the section of the book about building or registering your company. Because I do recommend that when you invest in real estate, you invest in real estate as a business and not as an individual. Why? Because it's going to affect the way that you're taxed because it is going to protect you and give you certain uh, liability protections. So there's a whole section in the book about how you can decide what type of business or entity type that you want to create. If you're in Texas, you can go to the Secretary of State website and you can, you can register your company for $300. Um, if you, and so you can do that um, yourself. You don't need to get legal Zoom to register a business for you. You can do it yourself in five minutes online. So don't pay anybody to do that for you unless you want to. You can also have an attorney do it for you. You know, you can do whatever you want to do but you don't have to pay anybody to do that. I know I registered a business in, in Georgia as well when I was living there. So these things are simple. You can have multiple businesses. Some investors have a business for every single property they own because they want to have a separation of liabilities. They don't, they don't want their assets and their liabilities or their debts to be mixed together. They don't want any creditors to be able to come after another property if they own more than one. So it's up to you how many businesses you want to start. But I would just add about $300 in administrative costs to your deal if you plan to register a new business for every time you buy a property. And then, of course, you will have to file taxes 
on each business that you own. Okay, so back to partnerships. A partnership is where you have, the best type of partnerships to me is where you have one general partner and you have one limited partner, okay? You got two people or two businesses. The less people, the better. However, you can have partnerships with as many people as you want. But if you have one general partner and one limited partner, you have one active partner and you have one passive partner. Does that make sense? Your general partner is your decision maker, your manager, they file the taxes, they do the work or they make the decisions for who does the work. They do the hiring, they do the firing, they pick the materials. Your limited partner is normally going to be your capital partner, which means they're just there for the money. So this is where we just talked about private lending, where the lender and the investor are sort of like partners, except the lender doesn't get any equity or ownership in the deal. So that's the only difference. In this sort of partnership, the capital partner does not get a guaranteed return. However, they do get equity and they can have structured in the terms of the partnership that they get paid first. So whenever there's profits, the, the way you structure that partnership can be whatever the two or three or 10 partners agree on. So the capital partners can get their money back first and then the other partners can get paid the excess. You know, so some structure it as like an 80-20 split. Some people structure it at a 50-50 split. Some people do what's called a waterfall. A waterfall means that they'll have a higher payback or a higher split of equity until their investment is returned. And then it continues to decrease and, you know, until they receive their full repayment. And then whatever those final splits are will remain. So for example, if you raise $500,000 to purchase a building and your investor puts in 500,000, and in year one, you earned $200,000 profits. Your investor may say, I want 80% of the profits in, you know, 80% of the profits until I get my money back. So of that $200,000 profits, they're going to take 80%. You're going to take 20%. Okay. They're going to take 160. You're going to take 40. Well, you didn't put any money in the deal. You did the work but you didn't put any money in. So you're happy. You're like, I just got $40,000 in a year, but I didn't have to invest any money, right? Your investor is going to take that percent. And then, you know, maybe year one, year two, year three, by year three, they got their investment back. Now we go to a 50-50 split or whatever the split is after that. That's what a waterfall is. Okay. So does anybody... So a limited partner versus a private lender is a way to participate in real estate financially. Yes, both of those ways allows you to be a passive investor. Um, a private lender, you're going to have more protections because you're going to get a note, which is a promise to repay. Whenever you're a limited partner, you're going to get equity, which means if you truly believe in the project, you're going to benefit at, to a greater extent long term. So it's just up to you and your risk level and what you want um, in a convertible deal a convertible note would be a blend of both so you get to you kind of get the best of both you can decide somewhere in in the project if you want to convert to equity okay all right so partnership is so much to talk about i'm just looking at the time it's already one o'clock do y'all want me to keep going or do y'all want me to wrap up because it's saturday i know y'all got stuff to do I have one more section to talk about in, in this passive investing. And I just really feel like I didn't cover partnerships to the full extent, but I'll just say, I love a good partnership. You know, I told you about my neighbors. They're now gonna be a partner in five, sorry, six properties, all because they had two people with a similar vision. Oh, let me just say this. Partners don't always have to invest money. 
some limited partners can invest property. So if you own a piece of property, I mean, this is what bothers me a lot. It just bothers me, y'all. People that own property and they have no vision for it and they have no intention to ever do anything with it, but they don't want to sell it and they don't want anybody to have it. So that happens a lot in my family, but it happens a lot in these areas of distress. So you've got someone that's inherited their, their grandmother's land and they have no idea about real estate and they have no vision for this land. All they know is I don't want anybody to steal it because that was my grandma's land and I'm not gonna sell it and I'm not gonna ever do anything with it and I'm never gonna apply myself to learn how to develop it. I'm not gonna build a house on it. It's just gonna sit there and I'm just gonna say, I have this land. And I, that really frustrates me because it's not like they made an intentional strategy that this is an investment in land. It's just that they don't have any vision and they have fear. So because you don't have a vision and because you don't have knowledge and because you're afraid of losing something that was held in your family for so long, you fail to realize that a partnership is the best strategy for you. That means you can retain your ownership in your property, but someone that knows what they're doing and someone that has the capacity, the, the capital, or you know, they can leverage their credit they can take that land and build it and make it into a cash flowing investment that can continue to bring wealth into your family for many generations. In fact, you're not going to lose any of your land value. It's going to make your land value increase. It's going to make the property value increase. So if people could just overcome their fear and distrust, especially in Black communities, there's so much distrust. If people could just trust one another, and credible, credible people could find one another, then they could partner and bring value and purpose to the land and to these distressed properties that we see. What we see a lot is just vacant buildings where siblings can't agree on what to do with it, or they can't agree that they don't want to put any money into their properties. So they just sit vacant for 20 years. It's not bringing any money into the family. In fact, they're paying taxes on those properties and could potentially lose them if the taxes aren't paid. That's why so many properties are lost at tax auction. But if those same people would simply go to an investor and say, hey, we don't wanna lose our property and we sure don't wanna sell it because this was our parents' property and we really want to, we wanna hold this in our family, but we also wanted to bring in cash flow they could then sign a partnership agreement with an investor that would simply put that investor's name on the title with them as a co-owner. And that investor could, that investor could then use their resources to build that property and to cause it to cash flow. And the income on that property would be split between all the owners. And you can decide how much equity you give that investor. I've seen it happen. I've seen these type of deals happen. You don't have to sell your land. If someone comes to you or your family and they say, we want to buy your grandmother's house, don't sell your grandmother's house. Just say, no, we don't want to sell grandma's house, but we'll partner with you. We'll give you 20% equity in it, but you, you've got to fix it up. You've got to build it. You got to rent it out and we'll take 80% of the profits or we'll take 60%, whatever you can negotiate for yourself. That's how a good partnership works. Okay. So are you all considering yourselves on the passive side or you're looking for a passive investor to help bankroll your visions? Which one? What side are you on? Put it in the chat. Are you the passive investor with the money and you want to find a good partner like me? Someone that you know is going to do right by your money and you're just like, oh, I'm going to bet on Farrell. I'm going to bet on Katie. I'm going to bet on Tisha because I know then they've read this book, We Must Own. They know what to do. And I'm going to bet on them. Or are you, can I do both? Of course. You can do both. You can absolutely do both. You can do both. These are just different strategies. Okay, so I've got one more section to talk about. One more section. And then next week, we're going to talk about target market. 
And I want your homework to be, I want you all to come back and let me know what's your, what is your target market? And I want to know why it's your target market. Okay, Seth says he is passive and he eventually will move to become an active investor. Love it. You know what? My partners right now, they'll be very happy with me because, <clears throat> because the property values, even if I don't do any work, the property values, the properties appraised for more than what I bought them for. So I've got investors invested in a building that I bought for, for <clears throat> I bought the building for $480,000 and it appraised for $1.6 million. All they put in was anywhere from 10 to $20,000. So they invested 10 to $20,000 to buy into a $1.6 million development that's got, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity in it. Right, it's got at least half a million dollars in equity in it, and we haven't even done any work. So just imagine if you get an opportunity to be a private a partner, you should really think about it. You should really think about it because this is how you move from like your annual salary to like getting your annual salary salary in residual income. Okay, and then I have another deal that I purchased for four hundred and forty thousand. It appraised for eight hundred and ninety thousand. So on top of that, if these deals fall within some sort of opportunity zone or some type of area of persistent poverty or distress, then you can qualify for incentives, tax abatements, and grants that can also add equity into the deal, and that money goes into the into the balance sheet that goes to the investors that they can divide that money up. All right, so the last section is, we're gonna talk about crowdfunded investment strategies. Okay, so you all have heard of crowdfunded platforms. I'm trying to think of a name of a platform, like a GoFundMe, like a CrowdStreet. Have you all heard of those platforms? Okay, so we've seen people on those platforms raising money for t-shirts, raising money for business startups, right? You probably even given money to people that were going through some sort of hardship. Well, now that same concept has been approved by the SEC that will allow real estate sponsors to raise capital in a crowdfunded method. So there is a law that means that if you are not an accredited investor, accredited means you earn more than, I got to get my numbers out y'all because they changed them. Accredited investors mean that you earn more than, I want to say it's a hundred thousand a year. You earn, your net worth is more than a million dollars and you have more than five million dollars in assets i can have that wrong i really want to be right i want to be right i'm sorry y'all i'm sorry okay here it is a non-accredited investor are individuals who earn under two hundred thousand dollars a year as a single or under three hundred thousand as a married couple you have a net worth that's less than a million dollars and you have assets less than $5 million. Okay, so if your income is less than $200,000 a year, if your net worth is less than a million dollars and if your assets are less than 5 million, you are considered a non-accredited investor. And if, you're, if, if you exceed those thresholds, you are considered an accredited investor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. So there are investment limits for people that are non-accredited investors. So you all cannot just dig into your life savings and give it to me and let me invest it. By law, that would be a security. I would be breaking the law if I accepted your money if you're not wealthy. So unfortunately, there are rules that give opportunities to people that are already rich. 
and people that are trying to break out of poverty, like their ceilings that just will not allow you to do that through real estate investing, unfortunately, or just any type of investment. Um, so if you would like to crowdfund, there will be limits to the amount that you can invest. So during a 12 month period, the maximum that you can invest is $107,000 and there will be limits based on your income and your net worth. And there's calculations that you could, um, they'll probably calculate it for you when you log on to the crowdfunded websites to invest. But the good thing about investing in a crowdfunded model is the sort of a similar thing where you can become a private lender or you can participate in kind of like how I described REITs where they're going to go and they're going to build a hotel or they're going to build an apartment building or they're going to build houses or whatever it is. And you can invest through this crowdfunded platform. And what they'll do is they'll raise capital. They'll say, our goal is we want to raise you know, $10 million. And so they'll have a capital raise and they'll let people through marketing learn about this investment opportunity. They'll have pictures, they'll have a financial disclosure, they'll show you their plans, the location, and then you can invest typically as small as $50. You can go on there and you can buy shares or you can, you can invest with the interest rate if you wanna invest it as a loan and you will be paid out the same way I described in the other strategies. If the investment performs well, you'll get an interest rate. Well, regardless of if it performs, if you invest as a lender, you'll get a fixed interest payment for the period of time, the term that you invest your money. If you invest as an equity partner, you will get paid as a co-owner of that building and you will receive a residual payment if and when the project delivers and performs. So crowdfunded investments have been around for less than a decade. And because of that, there's not a lot of empirical data to kind of make you feel nice and warm and fuzzy about how your money will perform. Um, so it's really early in this technology that's allowing people to raise capital through like these online funding portals. However, if you're the type of person that you're like, I want to take a risk on this because I like to invest, I like investing in stocks, it's sort of similar that you can become a real estate investor without having to do any direct management. So any questions about crowdfunded platforms? In the book, I, I list out some names of some platforms like CrowdStreet, Diverse Fund, Equity Multiple, Yield Street, Realty Mogul, and Motive with a D, Motive. So those are some platforms you can research online. Now we've never seen these platforms perform in a depression. So we don't know how that will work in the event that there's a downturn in the economy because they haven't been around long enough for the real estate market to cycle. So that's just, uh, you could do your research on those and you might say, mm, I wanna put a little here, put a little there, put a little here, put a little there. You know, we don't know what happens if these companies go bankrupt or they go out of business. You know, technology platforms, they're very expensive to operate. So it might not even be the real estate that doesn't perform it could just be the actual platform site, like the website that you invested through. So um, do your research if you're interested in crowdfunding. And if you are a deal sponsor and you want to put together your own development project, you can also raise money to do your project on a platform like the ones I just mentioned. Most of those platforms have a minimum capital raise um, so they may say your minimum project needs to be at least $5 million. So you would have to think bigger on what you want to do. And then you can raise your capital on those platforms. They do charge fees for being a funding portal. Those fees can be anywhere from like 5%, 10% of how much you raise. 
kind of like a Kickstarter or a GoFundMe. So they'll give you that marketing tool to reach the masses. However, they're going to take a cut of it. So you just factor that into your capital raise. Whew. All right. Well, I've been talking a lot and this is supposed to be a book club, not a class. So does anybody have any comments? Anybody want to chime in and let me take a breath? Um, this is <clears throat> um, not about what you just talked about, but um, do you have an email that we can sell you the money? Oh yeah, um, let me... The email is invest at comma club community dot com. Invest at comma club community dot com. Tell me. I, I, how much did I say earlier? I think it's thirty six. Thirty six dollars. That's going to include your shipping and I will ship you a book today. And I'm really sorry about that. I've got to figure out what's going on. All right. Well, thank you all for um, chiming in with me on this wonderful Saturday. Carol, I have a question. Okay. It's not about what you just talked about, but it's back where you was talking about how some owners, they have multiple properties and then they have a business for each property. Is that, is that pretty common or is that a good thing to do to do it that way? It's for liability purposes. Yeah, I definitely think um, the more, like if you have different partners, you definitely need different um, businesses, right? So like if you have different ownership on the different properties, then you would need different businesses. Um, ah. But if you got the same partner and you're just doing different properties, like let's say you're gonna buy five properties together. Well, you could keep it under the same LLC or the same like partnership because that'll save you money with your tax filings. Mm -hmm. However, I would just say consult whoever files your taxes um, to really think through the tax consequences of either decision. And then you could even consult an attorney that might help um, explain to you the risk um, and the cost benefit analysis of both choices. Okay, so let me ask you this one quick. I don't know if you wanna answer this or not, but just say if I'm partnering in with someone and, and we starting out with one investment on a property, would it be best for me to have my LLC and them have their LLC? Or can you do it up under one LLC? So a joint venture would be if you both have your own companies and you bring them together into a new company that would, the owners and the members of that new company would be comp your individual companies, right? So you could do it that way. So it's sort of like adding layers between you and the, and the property. So mm -hmm. the property, let's say you have, um, you know, I'm trying to think of a name. Let's say you have Dallas Houses LLC and that is what owns your houses. And then Dallas Houses LLC is owned by Brenda Moss Enterprises and Katie Hennessy Enterprises. So uh -huh. the owners of that business are actual companies. And then uh -huh. your individual business, Brenda Moss Enterprises, is owned by Brenda Moss. Uh -huh. So that, that's how it would look like if you said, if we need to get our own businesses. However, you could just start a business with Katie and that could be Dallas LLC, Dallas Houses LLC, that's owned by Katie Hennessy and Brenda Moss as the members or owners of that LLC. You can do it either way. Oh, okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. Awesome. Thank you so much.
You're welcome. Well, um, anybody else before we head on out of here? Nope. Okay. Well, so I will I will drop the book if you all um hey, somebody's speaking. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to take the mute off on the phone, but um yeah, that was that was very great. Very great um information that you gave. So yeah, I just wanted to just let you know that was that was really good. It was really and educational. Thank you very much. I appreciate that feedback. Appreciate it. Because um, Saturdays is my only off day. And seeing to it that I'm spending it with you all, I want it to be productive. So um, thank you all for joining and being so engaged. I really appreciate it. I'm only doing this because I want to give you all the opportunity to ask questions about the book. So it's not really supposed to be a class. It's supposed to be me answering your questions. So hopefully like everybody will get the book and you'll be able to come next week with your actual questions so that I can be more helpful to you all. And so now that we've gone through all the investment strategies, next week I wanna start by talking about which one you have selected as your first strategy. And then we'll go into property types because these strategies can be implemented on different property types. So we'll talk about property types and then we'll talk about target market and we'll close out section two. All right. All right, everybody. Sounds good. Y'all have a great weekend and please bring a friend next week. Tell somebody about this. I'm going to post it on Facebook. So can y'all go follow the Comma Club community page? And would you do me a favor and would you share this, um, share the post that I'm going to make so we can get more people aware that this is going on? Okay. All right. See y'all. Have a great weekend.